Okay, according to my computer, it is the top of the hour, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, so we are going to get started. Good afternoon. Welcome to today's webinar, Issues in Vertical Transportation Litigation, an interactive webinar for all legal professionals on vertical transportation litigation. During the presentation, our presenter, Dr. Stephen Carr, will cover the following, an overview of vertical transportation, safety codes, strategic litigation decisions, the standard of care, settlement and trial statistics. This presentation is based on Dr. Carr's work on over 200 cases in 37 states over the past decade. The presenter for today's webinar is Dr. Stephen Carr. Dr. Carr holds engineering degrees from Cal Berkeley and the University of Utah at Salt Lake. He created and managed a new product development company for over 30 years and has testified on product defect, patent infringement, and other intellectual property issues during that time. Today, he's a, he is an engineer with Technology Litigation Corporation, specializing in elevator and escalator accident investigation. He serves on several of the committees that write safety code for elevator and escalators. There will be two question and answer sessions during today's presentation. If you have a question, I invite you to use the chat feature or the Q&A feature, which is found on the right-hand side of the screen. We encourage all attendees to submit questions throughout the presentation. Approximately one hour after the event, we'll send out an email with a link to the archive recording of the webinar. And we do ask that you take time to fill out the survey that will appear on your screen after the webinar is over. I now invite you to sit back, relax, and enjoy. I'm now going to turn the presentation over to our distinguished guest today, Dr. Stephen Carr. Dr. Carr, it's all yours. Thank you, Matt. We'll be talking today about my specialty, which is vertical transportation accident investigation. And when we say vertical transportation, we're referring to elevators, escalators, moving walks, sidewalk elevators, dumb waiters, home elevators, and more. And just for reference, elevators are devices that move up and down vertically at 90 degrees, but can be tipped over as far as 70 degrees. Escalators are always right at 30 degrees from the horizontal, and moving walks are either horizontal or can be up to 12 degrees uh, elevation. A principal point that I would want to mention is that the owners of vertical transportation equipment are common carriers, just like bus lines and airlines, and they're held to a higher, higher duty to provide safe transportation. As Matt said, I have engineering degrees, and I've spent the last decade learning about and investigating accidents in vertical transportation. Now, my comments today are based upon my experience, and some of what I say would probably apply to any negligence action, so I'll defer to you if uh, that will be apparent to you. What I will say applies to both plaintiffs and defense counsel. My perspective is more often with a plaintiff, so if, if you hear it that way, turn it the other way around and you have an input for a defense attorney. I do work for building owners, and uh, building owners are often named as defendants and then become plaintiffs when they go after the elevator company that uh, they view as not having done an adequate job. There's approximately 300 million people in the United States, and there are approximately 800,000 working elevators and 35,000 escalators. Data is hard to come by, but by best estimates, there are approximately 17,000 accidents each year on vertical transportation equipment. Roughly 40% are due to trips and falls going in and out of an elevator car because it is not level with the landing floor. And an equal number are the result of the closing doors striking the pedestrian as they attempt to get in or out, which leaves about 
that are deadly fall down the shafts, crushing situations, and so on. It is said that vertical transportation is the safest form of travel on a per mile basis. There are approximately 7,000 escalator accidents a year, but the numbers are very hard to come by. A few years ago, the Consumer Product Protection Agency was brought in to look at escalator accidents, and that is their statistic, the 7,000. The accidents on escalators fall into two main categories. Entrapment refers to an extremity, a child's finger or toe, being caught and amputated in the process. A danger area is between the steps and the side panels we call the skirts. Another danger area is down at the comb where the escalator goes into the floor or as the steps come together to form a flat territory. Falls are more of a problem for older citizens and are usually the result of the escalator stopping for no apparent reason. It simply comes to a stop. People on the escalator, of course, are moving. By Newton's first law, they will tend to continue moving, and so they fall over. I would also point out that escalators move a lot of people quickly in a short distance, while elevators move a few people many floors, a much longer distance. But we find escalators only in a few places, malls, transit terminals, sports stadiums, occasionally a convention center, or a hotel lobby up to the next floor. And, of course, we find elevators everywhere. Well, almost everywhere. Uh, this map shows the states in which I have investigated accidents personally, and I can't explain why I haven't had any case in Alabama, North Carolina, or Virginia, but it's clear enough why I haven't yet been to Montana or North Dakota. Uh, elevators are where the majority of the population is. And, by the way, there are four main international elevator companies. The first being Otis Elevator, which is the only American major elevator manufacturer and servicer. But in addition, there is ThyssenKrupp from Germany, Kone from Finland, and Schindler Elevator from Switzerland. And they all have a large presence here in the United States. The nationally recognized safety code for elevators is created and maintained by the American Society of Mechanical Engineers. But it has no force of law until an authority having jurisdiction, an AHJ, adopts all or part of the code. And most enforcement is on a state basis. So, for example, in Washington State, the state inspects elevators except for the cities of Spokane and Seattle. In Texas, the state inspects everything except in the city of Houston. The code that applies is the code in force when the equipment was installed or modernized. And this is one of many good reasons to have an expert because of the complexities of navigating the code. The total code that your expert needs to have command of ranges between 1,200 pages and 2,600 pages depending on the details of the case. For example, the main code, 817.1, is also coupled with 17.2, a guide for the inspection of elevators and escalators and moving walks. 17.3, a code for existing elevators and escalators. 17.4, rescue procedures that are approved, and so on. And there's still more codes. For example, A17, 117.1 is a code for uh, the disabled, and there's a companion ADA AG code. In addition, for all escalators and elevators, the National Electrical Code is a factor, and there are numerous building codes everywhere. The code committee of, of ASME consists of approximately 400 people, which I'm one. I sit on three of the subcommittees that uh, work on the overall code. Now, the public has many misconceptions when it comes to 
vertical transportation. I often hear a prospective plaintiff say, the elevator went into free fall. It was just like falling off the building. Well, elevators don't free fall in almost all cases because when they start to do that, a device invented by Elijah Otis now some 170 years ago called a safety comes into play and stops the elevator before it gets going very far. It can still be a rugged stop, but it does stop the equipment. Nonetheless, elevators can accelerate too rapidly and stop too quickly and injure people, even though they don't technically do what, as physicists, we call freefall. Another common public misconception is that thinking that if the elevator is stopped between floors and the doors aren't opened, that the passengers must get out as soon as possible. Nothing could be further from the truth. The safest place to stay in a stalled elevator is in the elevator. Unless you know that the building is on fire, say like the World Trade Center, you're much better off to stay in the car. And many accidents happen when terrified people attempt to get out on their own. We have Hollywood to blame for this and all the horror films and the crazy things that are shown, but in reality, people need to stay in the elevator until they are rescued, even if they're elevator experts. Escalators are thought by the public to be understandable and safe, while, as I just said, many people think of elevators as dangerous. In actual fact, the opposite is true. Elevators are relatively safe. Escalators are relatively dangerous. In fact, there's no other machine in modern America where fast-moving metal parts can be placed in close proximity to unsuspecting passengers. And finally, some people have the idea that escalators must be safe because the government approves them. In actual fact, uh, we're all looking for ways to make safer escalators, but the Consumer Product Safety Commission and their work would attest to the fact that on a per-unit basis, we have far more accidents on escalators than on elevators. And sometimes you'll hear someone say, it's obvious and open, these dangers, and what's the problem? Well, the industry knows that there's a problem because we have a nonprofit organization called the EESF, the Elevator Escalator Safety Foundation, with a budget of something on the order of $4 million a year, mainly provided by the elevator companies, with the goal of educating riders to safer, safer operation of the equipment. So it is simply not open and obvious to a large fraction of the population. Now, elevators are maintained by mechanics, or what the companies might call service technicians, and most of the mechanics, not all, but most are members of the International Union of Elevator Constructors, the IUEC. Not surprisingly, the first chapter of the IUEC was in New York City about 100 years ago, and today there are approximately 140 locals in major cities across the country. Elevator mechanics are high school graduates. There are men and women, uh, mostly men, but some women. Um, of the blue-collar trades, elevator mechanics are the most highly paid, with salaries ranging from 60 to 90,000 per year. There's no school per se. A person is taken off the street and starts as a helper and begins a training course that can last anywhere from four to seven years. It goes to school once a week in the evening on a program presented by the union or their employer. And I would point out that mechanics, when they sign up with the IUEC, are also sworn specifically to never testify against the brother. Might complicate some discovery from time to time. <laughs> the four major companies I mentioned earlier are all union, but there are many regional smaller elevator companies, and some are union and some are not. As with every litigation, there are strategy decisions, and most of what's up there is surely standard uh, to you. <clears throat> but I want to point out that these cases are protracted and difficult. And if you don't do them regularly, you want to think of it of a similar complexity and to a malpractice, medical malpractice case. And so that leads to the question I often get, well, how small a case is too small? I sometimes get a phone call from 
somebody who thinks they've been injured and they've got, you know, $5,000 of meds and they want to find justice. My general advice is if, the, if you can't be confident the case is worth at least $100,000, you wouldn't want to get involved. I have seen <coughs> elevator companies spend 50000 to avoid paying 25000 They don't want to be taken advantage of. They don't want to be thought of as wimps. So the smallest case I would ever suggest being involved with is at least $100,000. Now, like, I guess every tort case, if I hope I got that right, there's, a, there's liability phase and there's the damages phase. And another measure I see of attorneys that don't do these cases regularly is they'll say, well, the liability is clear. There was a witness. There's no doubt that the equipment hurt the person. But liability is almost never certain from the defense point of view. Did the person put their hand in between the doors, expecting them to back up, and they didn't? Did they put their hand in far enough? Were they holding the handrail when the escalator stopped? Should the escalator have stopped? So, in my view, there's always liability issues. Now, besides the plaintiff who's suing, the main defendants will be the owner of the equipment, primarily the building owner, and possibly a maintenance uh, service organization if it's a big chain or a big company, and then the company providing service for the equipment. It is almost never the manufacturer of the equipment. Now, we mentioned the four major companies earlier, and they all make escalators, and they all maintain each other's escalators. So just because it says Schindler going into the escalator doesn't mean Schindler is the service company. It could be Otis, for example. And the building owner is probably going to tell you quickly enough, certainly after you file suit, but the building owner doesn't want to have problems, and now they have a problem, and you can probably find out who the maintenance company is pretty easily. And an issue you all probably know more about than I do, but I'll say from experience, plaintiffs like to be in state court, defendants like to be in federal court, and usually there's no problem showing diversity. For one thing, the maintenance records are maintained in computers at the home facility of the big four elevator companies. So unless you're in New Jersey, for Schindler, Texas for Dallas, or Texas for ThyssenKrupp, Connecticut for Otis, or Illinois for Kone, they're from another state. And you'll need to develop the theories of the case, what happened. And here again, an expert is absolutely essential. You cannot adequately interpret the maintenance records without the input from someone who understands the equipment. Uh, for one thing, the mechanics don't write very much. You have to, to read between the lines. You have to look at it from an experienced uh, point of view. And my view of why experts are so important in vertical litigation is as follows. Engineering issues need explaining to judges and juries. And, of course, there's often more than one explanation. There's the most probable, most likely cause of an accident. And your expert will be essential in getting that across. Secondly, the technical information that's needed is hard to acquire. This isn't rocket science, but it's hard to get the information. You don't just call up and ask for the manuals. Discovery itself is tricky and difficult. And again, an expert retained early on can keep you on track and help the discovery to help you instead of hinder you. Then as I said earlier, there's a large volume of complex codes and the codes interact and they interact over time because different, co different versions of the code apply to different installations. And then for that matter, there are local codes. California, for example, has what they call the elevator safety orders, which, of course, are based on the ASME code, but are still a different document. Also, when you go looking for an expert in this field, forget the 50-50 rule. Everyone would like experts that are about half on the plaintiff and half on the defense side. That is simply not possible in this field. There are only four elevator companies. And while every expert is charged with being uh, truthful and getting to the bottom of what happened and so on, if you work for an elevator company, if you were retained by an attorney for an elevator company, they're not going to countenance the expert also working somewhere else for a plaintiff. 
I know a man who spent his life at Kone in Illinois, a great guy. When he retired, he became an expert for Kone. And about two and a half years ago, he strayed and actually worked for a plaintiff. And they wrote him off. They'll never work again for them. So TASA can find you an expert that's either previously worked for plaintiffs or defendants, and it's an important uh, consideration. To be an elevator expert, there are several important criteria. One is in-depth knowledge of the equipment. Your expert cannot possibly get knowledgeable enough on a single case cannot possibly understand the equipment in the depth that is necessary. The second important thing, if you're a plaintiff's counsel, is finding an expert who is free of industry conflicts. Most people in this field learn how our equipment works by working for an elevator company. And that's fine. Some will work for plaintiffs. But in general, it's a closed-knit society, a lot of loyalty. I'm all for loyalty. But you need an expert who isn't uh, conflicted with his past in the elevator business. Thirdly, you need an expert who has formal engineering training and practice, someone who can do the math, someone who knows that Newton's three laws of motion apply very directly to how the elevator or the escalator works. To get to what we just discussed, they would also have other vertical transportation forensic and accident reconstruction experience and should be able to point to it. And of course, finally, in any field, you like an expert who has been an expert with us before, so you don't have to explain discovery and uh, depositions and so on. But the principal, first, first three are the principal ones. In-depth knowledge of the equipment, freedom from conflicts, and ability to do the engineering that's always involved in an accident reconstruction. These machines were designed by engineers to the engineers to analyze what went wrong. This time, I'll turn it back to Matt for any questions or comments you may have. Sure. Uh, Stephen, we have a question from Joel who asks, are there any statistics available comparing numbers of elevator slash escalator trips to stairway trips? I'm not aware of any. Uh, that's not to say there aren't, but... Uh, I don't deal in uh, building codes and stairways, uh, fixed stairways, so I can't uh, really answer that for you. Okay, we uh, we have another question um, who asks, um, are you seeing anything uh, in the way elevators are es and escalators are manufactured today that makes them more and or less safe? Yes, uh, the equipment is only getting better, only getting safer. Uh, Otis uh, recently, within the last three or four years, came out with an escalator that eliminates the step to skirt entrapment that I spoke of earlier. Certainly, the companies have good engineering staff. They're trying hard. Things are getting better all the time. Um, what are the um, major issues with uh, escalator safety? I mean, how can uh, a rider of an escalator mitigate their risk? For one, never let children ride alone. Uh, the signage is rather cryptic, but it shows an adult holding the hand of a child and the adult holding the handrail. This is extremely important. Um, again, because people are so cavalier about escalators, they just don't seem to realize the tremendous danger. So stand away from the edges. We now, on the latest equipment, paint yellow strips around the steps to uh, help remind people not to get too close. Many escalators have brushes to keep your feet away from the edges. Uh, with elevators, uh, vastly improved door strike protection equipment has been developed and been on the market for about a decade, but is not widely installed. So don't assume the doors are going to open up just because you put a body part in there. But that would be some of the uh, suggestions I would make. Okay. Uh, regarding the body part uh, with the uh, the elevators, um, do you um, do you see a lot of cases where people try to put their hands in between the doors closing, and what are the risks involved uh, with doing that? I see, I see a lot of people trying to do it, and the risks are severe. Doors typically weigh three or 400 pounds, and they're being moved horizontally by a door operating machine that's up on top of the elevator. If the sensors don't detect you, for whatever reason, the doors keep coming. 
and uh, significant damage uh, will, will occur. Okay, we have a question here. Um, do you have any comparison in accident numbers uh, for vertical transportation versus stairs? I mean, is there uh, an order of magnitude um, of accidents between uh, those that occur on vertical transportation and those that occur on uh, on stairs? I'm sorry, folks. I just don't deal in stairs. I have done a few cases where because the elevator was down, the elderly resident was forced to use the stairs and had a problem. But as far as day-to-day -day use, I really don't know. In all but a two-story building, most people in a business situation tend to take the elevator, two or three stories. Um, stairs are generally used only when the elevators are down and the building needs to be evacuated. I'm sure you've all seen the sign, in case of fire, use stairs, not the elevator. However, we're doing a lot of rethinking in that area because when a building is 50 or 100 stories tall, uh, most people cannot walk down that many stairs. Okay, great. I don't see any more questions in the queue, so why don't we continue on with the presentation of content. Oh, we have a question here that just came in, a couple questions, so we're going to continue with the question and answer session. Uh, Christopher asks, if you have a power outage in a building and the elevator does not level when the door opens, to what or whom would you attribute fault? Power outage is a definite problem. The elevator will stop. The door shouldn't open unless the car is within 18 inches of the floor and you should go to get out. Uh, your expert would have to work with you on that. Um, some facilities do have backup power, and a hospital might be a good example of one that probably should. But most elevators do not have backup power. And uh, one thing I routinely do is get a check with a power company as to what happened that day for those situations where it's being blamed on the power company. I'd like to know for sure if there was a power outage. Okay, great. We have a question here from Greg who asks, what standard do you use to determine that a defendant is not properly maintaining an elevator or escalator if the contract doesn't define the parameters? And I think this is something you may get into in the next couple slides. Well, sure, but I can say a little bit about that in, along these lines. There are two major types of elevator contracts for maintenance. The simple, the easy one we call euphemistically oil and grease which means the mechanic will show up on some grease schedule probably once a month, take a look, provide a little oil, a little grease. And even though the company isn't responsible for doing further repairs, they're still responsible for telling the owner if they see a problem. And in fact, they should tell them because it's good sales because they'll get more business because it's oil and grease only. The full service contract, which is more typical of big buildings and the big companies, includes all the parts and labor to keep the elevator operating properly. So uh, that's what I, I look to uh, is the standard of care is, first of all, following what the contract promises. Sure. We have a uh, follow-up to the power outage question. Uh, it is a hospital-related matter, and I would need um, – he's asking, would, would you recommend that he bring in both an electrical expert and an elevator expert then to comment on it? No, I think the electrical issues are – well within the hand, arms of most uh, elevator experts. Uh, you might bring in a building expert because, of course, if there is automatic power backup, it supports much more than just the elevators. It may support the operating rooms, for example. So I would think it's more of a hospital expert and an elevator expert. Excellent. I don't see any more questions in the queue, so why don't we continue on with the presentation of content. We will be taking another question and answer break, so... Uh, if you think of a question or you weren't able to get your question in during this session, uh, please use the chat feature or the Q&A feature to submit it at any time, and we'll pitch you into the next question and answer session. All right, then. I'm often asked about a couple of details in the sequence of a case. Of course, the basics here are obvious, but there's often a question of when to get the records versus when to inspect the equipment. I favor getting as much discovery as early as possible. I believe at least a third of the cases that I do are lost or the results are diminished greatly because of the inadequacy of discovery early on. There are various information sources that uh, your expert will go to to try to get to the bottom of what happened so they can explain it to the jury. The first is accident reports from the time of the accident. 
Maybe it's the EMTs, maybe it's the building security, if it's a large building with a security guard force, or uh, uh, the employer, if it's an employee uh, injury situation. But these are usually available, and they're very important. The EMTs often can't remember one bloody accident from the next, so you may not get as much there, but it's worth trying to do that. Then two is the maintenance records, and I'll go into more detail with it later, but maintenance records are very important in analyzing what happened. Thirdly, uh, many buildings, especially large buildings or building groups like a campus, like a hospital campus, will keep their own trouble log of elevator and vertical transportation problems. And this is very worthwhile to get a hold of. And of course, depositions will depose the precipitant witnesses and so on. And then any expert you hire should have a significant personal library of information. I was counting this morning, I have 22 shelves of documents and it's always growing. Uh, so that's another very important information source. As soon as I learned the brand of the elevator and the model, I've, I've got something to go to. Then the authority having jurisdiction that we spoke of earlier maintains a file of information on every elevator that they know about. And they're supposed to know about all the elevators in their territory, they don't always, but if they have been informed, then they are inspecting the elevator once a year, and they initially signed off on its operation. And if there are significant accidents in this elevator, they will typically be in the state's file. So you want to get the file. Now, sometimes, you, in some jurisdictions, I've had to ask the attorney to file an information, freedom of information request, but in most cases, they'll give you the file. They might want you to pay the photocopy cost, but it's uh, not much. And then there's the inspection. Even if the accident happened several years before, it is almost always worthwhile to inspect the equipment. There's usually much to see from an inspection. And recently, code changes have required that certain maintenance records be kept in the machine room. And if you can, you want to ask for those in advance. Too often, the plaintiff's attorney is told that there aren't any records in the machine room, and then, of course, we find them there when we do the inspection. And then we ask for copies, and somehow the copies never get around until uh, they're too late to use. So if you're using an expert, and I hope you are, have them ask for the records that are kept by code in the machine room. And then finally, the expert uses their own background experience to fill in the gaps. A single maintenance record, a single callback record, uh, doesn't tell nearly the whole story in most cases. But a sequence, a context, is what uh, we're looking for. And when records are not very substantial, the expert's opinion is helpful in coming to grips with what's going on. Then there are the people to depose that become part of the information for the expert, the plaintiff, of course, and precipitant witnesses and emergency responders, perhaps, so again, it's been my experience that most of them can't remember a case three years prior. If you're a defense attorney, you may want your expert to give you some input before you take the plaintiff's deposition. Uh, try to determine whether they're telling the truth and the severity and what went on. And often a, a person uses words that are lay, lay words, lay speak for more technical matters, so an expert could be useful. If you're a plaintiff's attorney, you probably don't need an expert for the plaintiff's deposition, but before you depose any technical personnel, a mechanic or a mechanic supervisor or a PMK, you certainly want input from your expert on areas of investigation. Typically, the maintenance mechanic or mechanics will also be deposed. Sometimes their direct supervisor or the supervisor for the region are deposed. Representatives, representatives of the building owner or the management company can be useful as well. Now, there are many kinds of elevator and escalator inspections. For example, when the authority having jurisdiction does an initial inspection, it's called an acceptance inspection, it's quite thorough, and the records of that inspection go in the file. And then begins a inspection sequence, a process that's usually once a year where the authority uh, inspector comes in and 
looks at essentially how the elevator is operating relative to a checklist that he has. And in some of the 44 states that inspect elevators, they use, say, employees, such as California. And in other states, they use private individuals who have been certified by the state and are on a list that building owners can choose from, and the inspector then files a report with the state. This is the case in Texas and Florida, for example, and I'm a private inspector in both of those states. But the inspections we really care about in this context are forensic inspections. And, of course, the purpose is to get to the bottom of what happened. It's not that we'll necessarily find a smoking gun, but a getting an analysis of how the equipment looks at the time of the inspection is very helpful. Such an inspection typically can take three to five hours. It involves more than just looking. It involves testing, running uh, the equipment. There's instrumentation required. Of course, many small things you'd expect, like cameras and flashlights and gauges. But there's also instrumentation for determining deceleration and uh, speed of the equipment. And I'd like to talk further about maintenance records, because maintenance records are so important at getting to the bottom of what happens. There are monthly visits, typically, by the mechanic, and they would have a entry in these maintenance records. In fact, there's two kinds of visits by a mechanic. There's the prevented maintenance, and there's the callback. And the callback is to literally call back the mechanic when something fails. You want these records for several years before the accident if you're a plaintiff's attorney, and you want to try to limit them to nothing at all if you're a defense attorney. The a typical elevator may run for 20, 25 years, and so uh, six months is just a flash of the eye for an elevator. You want to get three years of records before the accident. And you want that for all the companion elevators in that facility. Now, a companion, consider an elevator lobby with four elevators. Those four elevators probably serve all the same floors. They're probably all passenger elevators. They were installed at the same time. They're the same type of equipment. They've had the same maintenance over history. You want the records for all the companion elevators. But for that matter, they even have an electrical connection between them for calling the car. And for the specific elevator, you want the records from the time of the accident until the inspection. So you can, so your expert can handle any changes that may have occurred since the accident occurred. You don't particularly want records for other vertical transportation equipment in the building. So if there's a parking garage, hydraulic elevator at the other end of the building, we don't need those. But we want the companion elevators that are involved uh, in the, with the accident. And as I said, multiple years. Now, Public policy limits are often those limits the use of remedial repair at trial, and that's fine. But for your expert who's trying to get to the bottom of what happened, the post-accident records are very important. And in many cases, no repair did occur, and presumably that might be admissible. So get those records. You can't do a good job in these cases without the records. Another form of information that the expert relies upon is correspondence between the defendants. The most obvious, of course, is the contract for service. That contract may be written by either the owner or the service company, depending on circumstances. If the owner is a large national chain running escalators all over the country, they likely wrote the service agreement. If it's a three-story medical building in El Paso, uh, the elevator company would certainly have written the contract. And these contracts often include a provision to indemnify or defend or hold harmless, whatever the words are, one to the other. And if you're a defense attorney advising your client, advise them not to let that happen again. It makes little sense for one to defend the other, for the interests are not aligned. The owner has the ultimate responsibility. They put their faith in the elevator company. And there's no reason that one attorney would be defending both, and it often leads to unfortunate consequences. A second form of communication is sales communications between the defendants. The defendants sorry. You'll see letters, 
sales letters, sometimes beginning with a comment that the elevator is old and in need of modernization. Uh, seemed harmless enough at the time the salesman wrote it, but that's useful. There's often emails between the vendor people and the owner's people. You want to get those. And then not everything is covered on the main service contract. There may be extra requirements. There may be remedial work. And so it's not uncommon to see extra or additional small contracts. You want to ask for those. And then finally, proposals. And proposals do not come just from the elevator company. There's a group of nationwide, nationally recognized and respected elevator consulting companies. And the owners often call them in to do an in-depth study of what's wrong and what's needed. And their proposals to the owner are often very telling. You want to be sure and get those if the owner is of a stature to have had such a consultant. Again, back to that three-story medical building, probably never had a consultant involved. And then the standard of care. The purpose of preventive maintenance is to avoid breakdowns resulting in callbacks. And callbacks are a measure of failure. So there will always be some callbacks, but there shouldn't be very many in a year's time. So the standard of care is to predict the problem and fix it before it happens rather than waiting for something to break and letting it happen. All too often when something breaks, someone's hurt. Not always, fortunately, but the kind of maintenance that leads to a lot of callbacks is a sign that the standard of care is not being met. The basic goal of elevator maintenance is to keep the existing equipment operating like new. Now, an older elevator, perfectly maintained, will not have some of the newer features, but it still should operate as it did when it was first installed. And in recent years, uh, we've, on the ASME committee, have instituted in the code a requirement that every elevator, no matter how old it may be, every operating elevator will have a maintenance control program, meaning a, not a piece of software, but a document, a maintenance control program that is available to the inspector and the mechanic at any time that they ask to see it. So if there isn't such a document, the standard of care is not being met. Most accidents are caused not by bad equipment design, but by deficient maintenance. Occasionally, you find someone vandalizing the equipment, trying to get hurt, trying to cause problems, or someone just lying, for that matter. But most of the time, vertical transportation accidents are caused by deficient maintenance. As with, I guess, most civil litigation, the cases resolve before trial. I understand from statistics I've seen, and certainly true in my experience, a high a percentage of the high 90s never actually get to trial. In 230 cases, I've only been in about 20 trials of uh, vertical transportation matters. About 60 or 70 percent settle after the deposition of the experts. But when they settle and how much is awarded is determined a lot by how the case is handled. And I favor aggressive discovery early on for both the plaintiff and the defendant, for that matter, to get to the bottom of what was going on or claimed to be going on that day. When cases don't settle, it can be expensive. These statistics are provided by Mark Jacobs, who's a respected and now retired Otis attorney out in California. And he published them recently in an issue of Elevator World. And though they're having cases of a very small award where the jury is trying to tell the plaintiff something, one quarter of the settlements, according to Mr. Jacobs, are over a million dollars. So plenty of reason to get it settled. Huh? Let's take another um, Q&A, perhaps I sense of things that invoke some questions. So, Matt, I'll turn it back to you. Uh, sure. We've had a flurry of questions since the last uh, Q&A uh, session. So. Uh, let me start off with uh, Catherine, who asks, so the records kept by service provider and those kept in the machine room are different, or are they just two copies of the same records? That's a good question. The, um, traditionally, the records are only kept at the service provider, and in the last 10, 15 years, only on their computer. Um, but that makes it easy to get, by the way, because it's not abusive to ask for 
overly burdensome, as they sometimes say, to ask for a lot of records because it's a matter of a few keystrokes that cause them to be printed and shipped to the other side. Um, it's relatively recent to require records in the computer room, and the biggest single record is the maintenance control plan, which is a description of what kind of maintenance is needed to keep that specific elevator safe. It's not a generalized plan for elevators in general. It's for this specific elevator. Or if there are four elevators in the companion group, then I would think one plan would be fine. Um, there's also been a requirement over the years to have the electrical schematics, the wiring diagrams in the machine room available to the mechanic, and those should be there. I think the most fundamental record is always still at the maintenance provider, however. Okay, great. We have a question from Richard who asks, do any elevator or escalators have a black box that pre preserves data related to operations and incidents automatically? Well, yes. Uh, since uh, microprocessors started to be used to control the equipment back in the mid-'80s, there's been more and more potential to do that economically. And in some of the 1980s and early 90s series, there'd be a fault code, and actually it's like a fault code you might get in Windows, that tells the mechanic what happens when the equipment shut down or when the problem occurred. In even more modern equipment, where memory is not a problem and the equipment is fancy, there is a, 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 a trend to record every event over many months with a time stamp to the nearest fraction of a second, and this is retrievable. And if anybody deletes that before it's memorialized, uh, it's certainly spoilation of evidence. Now, escalators being inherently much simpler in their control have a lot less of this. But for the last at least 10 years, we've had in the code that if one of these emergency electrical protective devices triggers, it has to be manually reset so that the mechanic has to be called in. And if he's doing his job, he should note on the ticket what the problem was, what the number was, what the code was. And some of the newest escalators do also record a series of these events for use after the fact. Excellent. We have a question here from Greg who asks, what is the relevance of the companion elevators? They don't develop problems at the same time or for the same reasons, do they? Well, that's a good question, and it sounds reasonable on the face of it. However, when you're trying to get to the bottom of what happened, you want to look at the artifact and all the things you can look at. And companion elevators almost always are installed at the same time. Not always. If it's a different vintage, then you don't need to look at it. But they're installed at the same time. They're the same model, and they've had the same service over time. Now, they may have had both for... I'm going to have to call back to get Hello, Dr. Carr? Yeah, Matt, I'm going to have to call right back in. I've got a minor phone problem here. I'll be right back at you. Okay. Uh, for all those on the line, I apologize uh, for the uh, technical difficulty. I'm not exactly sure what happened. Dr. Carr and I are in two very different locations. Um, we will get to everybody's questions, and I hope this gives people, uh, this pause gives people a couple of seconds to uh, think about any questions that they may have for uh, Dr. Uh, Carr, who will be on the line here uh, in a couple minutes, I hope, or a couple seconds, I hope, I should say. Um, but uh, please uh, do stay on the line. We are going to complete this uh, this webinar and uh, get to everybody's uh, question and answer here as soon as possible. Dr. Carr? Yes. Are you back? I'm back. Sorry about that. Excellent. So uh, continue on with your response. I apologize. That's all right. We're talking about the significance of companion elevators. And while a particular accident sequence may occur in different elevators, the maintenance is surprisingly similar. And, of course, the equipment are direct copies of one another. And I would ask you, if you had a few school buses and the driver had a failure, but he got the bus stopped and no one was hurt, would you not go look at the other school buses of the same exact design in the same fleet? Design, you dumb fuck. What? I heard somebody come on there, Matt. Are you yeah, if you have your telephone on, please uh, just mute them. Thank you. <laughs> At any rate, I've never had a judge deny the request for companion elevator data when they understand why. Um, okay, we now have a question from Joel who asks, uh, if the owner got an upgrade or replacement recommendation from the elevator company, does that 
discharge the company's responsibility. Well, I certainly can't give legal advice. The owner remains responsible. Uh, a wise elevator company certainly will speak up and tell the owner when they need to do more than simply have a monthly maintenance service. But as far as who's discharged, so I believe that's for the jury. Okay. Um, we now have a question from uh, Elliot who asks, what are the typical contributory negligence issues in escalator cases involving young children? The biggest single thing is the spacing between the escalator steps and the skirt, the side panels. There have been so many entrapments over the years that about 15 years ago, the uh, Consumer Product Safety Accounts Committee, or commission it is, were called in, and they commissioned a significant study, multi-million dollar study, by uh, Arthur Little, and came up with parameters that dictate how close, as opposed to how far, uh, one part should be from the other. And in fact, the machine was invented, and most... Uh, Experts in this field ought to have one, which measures that distance and can give a report as to whether that distance is in compliance. The further away the skirt is from the step, the easier it is for a child's foot or finger to be sucked in. Excellent. We now have a uh, question from Chris who asks, um, is there a reason that a building owner would not point the finger at an elevator company or service maintenance provider? <laughs> uh, again, I, that one I, I really don't know why they would, provided they have a third-party maintenance company. I think they would try and get them involved. And we now have a question uh, from Jennifer who asks, are building owners required to keep trouble laws? No, I don't think so. I'm not aware of any requirement for that. Large buildings do it in the course of the normal business. Uh, an intelligent manager might look at that box saying we're having far too much trouble on elevator number three, but I'm not aware of any code or governmental requirements to keep such a log. Uh, we have a follow-up to the black box question. How is easy it is, is it to retrieve and preserve the data from an elevator incident, assuming the correct model elevator is involved? Well, the elevator manufacturers provide a device plugs into the elevator controller. And if the elevator equipment, the control equipment, is proprietary, meaning it's made by just that one brand of company, um, it may be hard to get such a box. Uh, there are companies that make alternative boxes, one called Freedom Electronics, makes it for that very reason, Freedom, makes it possible to plug in and look at the codes. I think in most cases, I would depend on the mechanic's integrity to write down the code and not delete them. But in several test cases, the defendant has printed out a very large elevator, prints out on a printer, uh, or gets in a file, a PDF file, the actual history of events in the last many minutes before the accident. Okay, we have a question from Joel who asks, what devices or maintenance techniques are effective in preventing skirt entra entrapment? Do brushes work? Frankly, brushes don't work. Um, there's a much better device that hasn't been widely accepted. But uh, brushes don't do much. They're good for polishing shoes, I think, uh, when riding the escalator. Um, they're designed, of course, to suggest you shouldn't be near the edge, and that's fine. But when a small child can fall, their little hand goes scooting under the brush and into the crack between the step and skirt. So that is about all the sudden, keeping the skirt properly adjusted. Oh, and another thing is the side panels are supposed to be slippery. So a hand or a croc shoe is more likely to be able to slide along and be pulled out. So on certain types of escalators, one of the maintenance procedures is to take a spray can of uh, silicone-based material and keep those surfaces sprayed to be as slippery as possible. So we have another question here from Elliot who asks, how much contributory negligence is generally attributed in an escalator accident involving young children if the parent is not holding the hand of that child? Well, I, I can't give you a um, reasoned average because, as I said, most of these cases settle, and the apportionment, the amount of settlement, I'm generally not uh, told. Um, certainly from the industry's point of view, from my point of view, the child should be controlled. On the other hand, it isn't obvious to most adults how very dangerous this equipment is. 
So I don't know. Uh, how, I think individual cases go differently depending on the skill of the plaintiff and defense attorneys. Excellent. Uh, we do have a question here that asks, um, you've talked about that you've worked on 200 cases in 37 states over the past decade. Um, how many, what percentage have you worked on that have involved escalators, ele elevators, dumb waiters? I mean, what, what, what's the background in kind of cases that you see? Well, I understand. Well, all of my work in the last decade has been vertical transportation. And of 230 cases, about 40 or so, 45 have been escalator. Some waiter, very rare, I've only had two. Uh, moving walks at airports are so safe that we almost never have a report. I heard the chief inspector in Texas tell me, to tell the group a month ago, that while he had you know, 400 escalator accidents, he had exactly one moving walk accident over that time. It was a drunk who fell down while he was riding. So most of those peripheral devices, uh, I don't see much of. It's mainly the mainstream elevators and escalators. There is a whole other class of equipment, and that's home elevators. They're becoming much more popular because the basic price of a home elevator is in the range of $20,000, $30,000. If the house has a hoistway already prepared, that is. If you have to build one on the outside, it's a whole different thing. But more and more homes are having elevators, and most jurisdictions do not inspect home escalators. Really? Is there, are there any plans to uh, codify um uh, any regulations for home elevators? Well, there is provision in the code for what home escalators are supposed to do, but the AHJs decide what they're going to enforce, and budgets are often tight. And, of course, home elevators have limited access. So for various reasons, most jurisdictions do not currently inspect home elevators. Okay. I do not see any other questions in the queue. So if you have... Any questions, uh, please do submit them to us, and we'll try to get them answered before the conclusion of the event. But I'm going to turn it over to um, Dr. Carr again for the conclusion of today's program. Well, thanks. Just a couple of things. I thought you might like to know a couple of reference works. I recommend the first one, which is Elevator and Escalator Accident Reconstruction and Litigation by Jim Philippone and three others, published by lawyers and judges publishing in Tucson, Arizona. You can be sure any attorney who regularly is in this business for the defense will have that book. If you're a plaintiff's attorney, you got to get one. Uh, the other documents I have here are just in case you're interested, but I do recommend them because the complexity is such, I believe, you're much better served to find an expert that already knows all this stuff. But if you want to look on the website for Elevator World, that is the source of many publications. And for example, Zach McCain's Elevator 101. It's only, I think, 100 and so pages. Vertical Transportation Handbook, three or 400 pages. And you could go and buy code from the ASME there in New York City, asme.org. Uh, the code's about $400, but that's the least of it. Interpreting the code is where the expense is. And just to repeat uh, some of the things that I've talked about today, we've talked about the different types of equipment and its location and something about the types of accidents that occur on each. We talked about the extensive safety codes that may apply depending on the jurisdiction of authority where your accident occurred. We discussed public misconceptions like elevators are dangerous and escalators are safe. We talked about the likely participants in this litigation, my view on what is needed in experts in this field, and then, of course, the sources of information to get at what happened after the fact. Most of the time when I'm called, the accident was two years ago. Occasionally in a death case, I'll get in right away. But in general, it happened quite a while back. So all sources of information are very important. And finally, I have a little video I'd like to play for you. Matt, I don't see it coming up, though. Do you have control? Yeah, on I will. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll put it up for everybody. Just hold on for... Uh... For one second here, uh, we've got a little video. Um, so uh, you should have seen it appear on your screen, and now we're going to play it for you. There will be a little delay here.
Okay, I think everybody was able to see the video. So um, with that, we want to thank everybody uh, for participating today. Um, I thought it was a great uh, presentation of content. Thank you, Dr. Carr. It showed how much effort you put into today's presentation. And thank you to everybody that, um, that took an hour out of their busy schedule to join us today. Um, if you have any questions uh, or you'd like to talk to Dr. Carr about a case, uh, you can contact us here at CAFLA. Our telephone number is up on the screen, 800-523-2319. Uh, we will be sending out a link to the archive recording of this webinar uh, tomorrow morning. Um, the archive recording will also be posted in uh, the Knowledge Center of CAFLA's website. Um, our next webinar, the Commercial Motor Vehicle, or sorry, yeah, Commercial Motor Vehicle Rack, the first 24 hours, will take place on Wednesday, June 30th, 2010 at 2 p.m. Eastern Time. And if you have any follow-up questions or comments, uh, we're always looking to improve these programs. Please send me an email at mhide at passinet.com, and we'll take your questions and comments under consideration and, and use them to uh, improve uh, our product. So thank you again for attending. Uh, we do appreciate it. And uh, Dr. Carr, thank you so much for taking time to put this program together. Thank you, man.